So we're going to talk. We're going to talk today about attachment, and um, some of that in the context of running your groups, but also. Um, I get rid of the academic portion of this, so my, mine is attachment and intimacy. Ah, oh, this is going to work. Okay. So attachment theory looks at the way that we connect with the significant people in our lives. And from cradle to grave, we need to have people in our lives to whom we matter who will, value, who will value us, who will be there for comfort and support in times of stress. And really, that is what enables us to handle the stressors that life throws at us. Now, if you looked at the agenda, you noticed that both of my, uh, both of my colleagues had these wonderful titles that had this wonderful alliteration on C. Andrews was um, creating a culture of connection, and Trina had the correction the connection is correct, or the correction is connection. So I thought, well, you know, my, mine, I just had attachment intimacy, so I thought, well, maybe I should call it cradle to casket connection. <laughs> what do you think? Was that, was that a better title? <laughs> hey, and then as long as my OCD was acting up, I, I looked at the order we were speaking and went, oh, it spells salt. <laughs> it's a sign. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, they you didn't know monk was modeled on me, did you? Okay. But I digress. Childhood experiences have a really profound impact on how we connect as adults. So how our caregivers responded to our needs, particularly in times of stress, impacts how we perceive ourselves and others in relationship. So as children, mom and or dad were our attachment figures. They were our primary caregivers. And they were the secure base from which we would go out and explore our world. And the safer those relationships were, the bolder we could be in exploring our world. So as long as I've got a safe haven to return to where I'm going to be loved and valued and comforted, where I matter and where my feelings matter, I can dare to be bold. So if parents were not responsive to the child's feelings, this will impact how the child sees himself in relationships and how he uh, attaches in close relationships. So when we look at attachment, we look along two continua, two dimensions. So one is anxiety. How much angst do I have in close relationships? And the other is avoidance. How much do I feel uncomfortable with rela close relationships so I tend to avoid? So when it's not comfortable with closeness, the tendency is to avoid the real intimacy. And so if we look at this and we say, OK, we can either be lo lo low or high in anxiety and low or high in avoidance or somewhere in between, we essentially come up with attachment styles then. You know, looking at those two dimensions. So if someone is low in both anxiety and low in avoidance, that, that makes secure attachment. So mo when mom and dad were generally responsive to our needs and emotions, and we learned that we were worthy of love and that other people were capable of loving us, the result is that we tend to be low on anxiety I'm not afraid of losing the one I love, and law and avoidance. I don't avoid those close relationships. I don't hide who I really am. I'm willing to engage emotionally. So this is the essence of secure attachment. I'm willing to ask for and to give emotional support, and I'm comfortable with those relationships. But what if the message that we took away from our childhood experiences was that I'm really not worthy of love, support, and comfort. If mom's response, mom and dad's responses were more dismissive during our distress, we might have learned that I'm really not lovable. If you really knew me, you wouldn't love me. You'd reject me. And when we enter into adult relationships, we might be higher in anxiety. So we have anxious attachment. 
our radar is finely tuned for any message from our partner that, that looks like rejection or abandonment. And when we see it, the anxiety kicks up, and we can go to great lengths to, to protest our partner's disengagement. And many times in couples work, when they get into negative cycles, very commonly we see a pursue withdraw pattern. One partner will pursue for connection, the other partner thinks that's, cra that's scary and they withdraw. This tends to be the, the attachment style of the pursuer. The, the tendency is when, when it feels overwhelming to be disconnected from your partner, you pursue for connection. It's anxious. So if the message we took from childhood was that I'm lovable, I'm, I may be worthy of love, but other people just aren't safe. They can't be relied upon to love me. Then we may have a more avoidant attachment style. We may learn to avoid close relationships and intimacy. Other people are not safe, but I don't need close connection anyway. Now, particularly for men, we have been taught through the socialization process to not appear as weak. Yeah? Big boys don't cry. And often at the start of couples therapy, men, men are able to identify two emotions. I feel good. I am therefore happy. I feel bad. I am therefore angry. The, those are the ones we know. We Recognizing the fear, the hurt, the uh, loneliness, the sadness has been trained out of us. And so we go through life sucking it up and pushing it down. And this works pretty well in corporate environments. It works well in military service. It works well in a lot of areas. Where it doesn't work particularly well and where it becomes problematic is in marriage. So that's avoidant attachment. So what if our underlying belief is both that I am not lovable and other people are not safe? So then we get into this fearful or ambivalent attachment. We long for closeness, but it's scary, so we can avoid. We experience this um, come close, go away kind of dynamic, this push-pull. So I can be afraid to get close to my partner and at the same time be afraid of losing my partner. So what does this look like in children? In 1970, Mary Ainsworth did a study. She called it the strange situation. And here was the setup. Mom and toddler are, are in the experiment room together. There are toys there. Toddler's just playing on the floor with the toys. Experimenter comes in, talks to mom for a minute. And then mom, mom goes and leaves the room. After a few minutes, mom comes back. So the point was to observe how does the toddler respond in these situations? What's it, what does it look like for separation anxiety when mom leaves? What does it look like when, when the experimenter is there, either alone or with mom? What, what is it happens on the reunion? And then, and then looking at what other behaviors do we notice? So about 70% of these children that she looked at had what she identified as secure attachment. So with that, when mom left, it was natural that the child would cry and, and feel that separation. Child would be friendly towards the stranger when mom was present, but when mom left would avoid the stranger, the experimenter who was in the room. And then when mom comes back, there's a happy reunion and the child is comforted by mom's presence. So we look at these situations as mom is a secure base and the child is able to explore his or her world based on proximity to that secure base. Then about 15% of the children showed ambivalent attachment. And these kids had great distress when mom left the room. They uh, avoided the stranger and showed fear of the stranger. But on the reunion behavior, they might move toward mom, but then avoid contact. They're mad, they're mad at her. There's a, there's a come close, go away to this. And these, these children tend to cry more than the, other, than the other attachment styles, and they also tend to explore their world less. Then another 15% she identified as avoidant. Mom goes, doesn't make any difference, oh well. My experimenter's there, experimenter's there, it, Okay with the stranger, okay with the stranger when mom's not there, it doesn't really matter. Mom comes back, no, no, 
no uh, interest when mom returns. So mom and the stranger are equally able to comfort the child. So what does this have to do with addiction, I hear you cry? What does this have to do with addiction? Okay, there we go. Making sure you're out there. This thing's still on? Okay. So um, addiction, sexual addiction among other things, I mean, it's multifaceted, but one of, but part of it is it's an intimacy disorder. And with that, as part of that, it's a failure to bond where the true, true intimacy has been replaced by sexual acting out. And that's what we've used to numb out the bad feelings. And Patrick Carnes, many of you are familiar with his work, one of the leaders in, in sexual addiction treatment, um, looked at families of origin for sex addicts and looked at it along two dimensions. One of them was, how connected was the family? Ranging from completely disengaged, there's little closeness or connection, to enmeshed where we're completely, where we're completely frozen in each other's business. And what he found was along that dimension, 87% of the sex addicts came from disengaged families where there was little closeness. Then the other dimension he looked at was how flexible is the family, going from everything from completely rigid families with our authoritarian leadership to just chaotic families where there was little organization at all. And what he found was 77% of sex addicts came from rigid families with authoritarian leadership and strict discipline. So if you grew up in that environment, what did you learn about close relationships? Well, you learned not to trust people. You learned that you had to be perfect or the hammer would come down. You learned not to show weakness. But you know about your own weaknesses and your failures, so you feel shame. So Dr. Brene Brown does research on shame and vulnerability. And she has a number of books out there, a number of talks that you can find on the internet, and I would recommend that you go take a look at those when you have a chance. But this morning I want to play just a, about a six minute clip from one of her TED Talks on the power of vulnerability. So I'm gonna put that up here and then, and then I'll come back and we'll talk some more. So I could tell you a lot about shame, but I'd have to borrow everyone else's time. But here's what I can tell you that it boils down to. And this may be one of the most important things that I've ever learned in the decade of doing this research. My one year has turned into six years, thousands of stories, hundreds of long interviews, focus groups. At one point, people were sending me journal pages and sending me their stories, um, thousands of pieces of data, um, and six years. And I kind of got a handle on it. I kind of understood this is what shame is, this is how it works. I wrote a book, I published a theory, but something was not okay. Um, and what it was is that if I roughly took the people I interviewed and divided them into people who really have a sense of worthiness, that's what this comes down to, a sense of worthiness. They have a strong sense of love and belonging. And folks who struggle for it, and folks who are always wondering if they're good enough, there was only one variable that separated the people who have a strong sense of love and belonging and the people who really struggle for it, and that was the people who have a strong sense of love and belonging believe they're worthy of love and belonging. That's it. They believe they're worthy. And to me, the hard part of the one thing that keeps us out of connection is our fear that we're not worthy of connection was something that personally and professionally I felt like I needed to understand better. So what I did is I took all of the interviews where I saw worthiness, where I saw people living that way, and just looked at those. What do these people have in common? And I have, I have a slight office supply addiction, but that's another talk. Um, <laughs> so I had a manila notebook, a manila folder, and I had a Sharpie. And I was like, what am I going to call this research? And the first words that came to my mind were wholehearted. These are kind of wholehearted people living from this deep sense of worthiness. So I wrote at the top of the manila folder. And I started looking at the data. In fact, I did it first in this very four, in a four-day 
very intensive data analysis where I went back, pulled these interviews, pulled the stories, pulled the incidents. What's the, what's the theme? What's the pattern? My husband left town with the kids. Um, <laughs> because I always go into this kind of Jackson Pollock crazy thing where I'm just like <laughs> writing and, and going and kind of just in my researcher mode. And so here's what I found. What they had in common was a sense of courage. And I want to separate courage and bravery for you for a minute. Courage, the original definition of courage, when it first came into the English language, it's from the Latin word cur, meaning heart. And the original definition was to tell the story of who you are with your whole heart. And so these folks had, very simply, the courage to be imperfect. They had the compassion to be kind to themselves first and then to others, because as it turns out, we can't practice compassion with other people if we can't treat ourselves kindly. And the last was they had connection, and this was the hard part, as a result of authenticity. They were willing to let go of who they thought they should be in order to be who they were which is you have to absolutely do that for connection. The other thing that they had in common was this. They fully embraced vulnerability. They believed that what made them vulnerable made them beautiful. They didn't talk about vulnerability being comfortable, nor did they really talk about it being excruciating, as I had heard earlier in the shame interviewing. They just talked about it being necessary. They talked about the willingness to say, I love you first. The willingness to do something where there are no guarantees. The willingness to breathe through waiting for the doctor to call after your mammogram. The willing to invest in a relationship that may or may not work out. They thought this was fundamental. I personally thought it was betrayal. Um, I could not believe I had pledged allegiance to research. Where our job, you know, the definition of research is to control, control and predict, to study phenomenon for the, reason, for the ex explicit reason to control and predict. And now my very, you know, my mission to control and predict had turned up the answer that the way to live is with vulnerability and to stop controlling and predicting. This led to a little breakdown. <laughs> which actually looked more like this. Um, and it did. It led to a, I call it a breakdown, my therapist calls it a spiritual awakening. <laughs> spiritual awakening sounds better than breakdown, but I assure you it was a breakdown. And I had to put my data away and go find a therapist. Let me tell you something. You know who you are when you call your friends and say, I think I need to see somebody who, do you have any recommendations? Because about five of my friends are like, woo. I wouldn't want to be your therapist. Um, <laughs> and I was like, what does that mean? And they're like, oh, I'm just saying, you know, like, don't bring your measuring stick. Uh, the rest of that talk is, is equally compelling, and so you can find it all over YouTube. But a few things I wanted to highlight out of there that, um, let's see, where did I leave off? She talks about... Uh, she talks about shame being the fear of disconnection. And we all have times where we live with that feeling that I'm not good enough. And in her research, what she found was those who were really able to embrace joy and intimacy were those who had a sense of worthiness. And these are the people who believe they're worthy of love and belonging. They have the courage to be imperfect. They have compassion for themselves and for others. And they have connection resulting from authenticity. So again, what does this have to do with addiction? Well, addicts tend to avoid true in intimacy and authenticity. This is one of the reasons why group is so important. Group, among other things, is about intimacy. Group should be a safe place to be real to have things really be authentic. 
So I wanted to give a little bit of biblical perspective around this as well, about attachment. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, everybody knows it, it's a great love chapter. And Paul is writing about all these things that love is. And he gets down to verse 12, and when he gets there, Paul writes, for now we see only reflection as in a mirror, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. So if we look at this verse, in heaven we experience the ultimate perfect love. And how does Paul describe that? He describes it as knowing and being fully known. It's a description of intimacy. It's a description of connection. And this is really scary if down deep I believe either that I'm not lovable or other people aren't safe. So to gain that prize of true intimacy, we need to be willing to risk vulnerability. Then in 1 John, John wrote, There's no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. So we know from experience the imperfect love that we human beings have for each other, and it's scary. But we have to risk vulnerability. Also, we're not going to find that perfect love in human relationships. Perfect love is found in Christ. But because of our identity in Christ, we do not need to be afraid. The more we can be authentic in our human relationships, the closer we come to experiencing the love without fear in our relationships. Then in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul's talking about um, relationships within the Christian family, talking about husbands and wives. And he slides back and forth between talking about husbands and wives and talking about Christ and the church to where it's almost hard to tell where he's made the transition between one and the other. But this is the kind of intimacy for which we strive. To be authentic in our relationships, the point at which we can experience true intimacy that reflects the intimacy between Christ and the church. So, you, you all came to hear about how do I apply this and how does this apply to my SA group. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to my colleague Andrew, who's going to talk about how attachment applies in your group and creating that culture of connection. Thanks, Scott. That was great. <clears throat> so, like Scott said, I'm going to be talking about how the support group is really one of the key elements to relearning attachment and helping those that are stuck in addiction to reconnect and rebond and learn secure attachment. And so, um, I want to start off by kind of, you know, dovetailing on what Scott was talking about. There's there's a, you know, two, two of the major foundations of connection and attachment is love and trust. And I'm going to go into a little diagram about how that works and um, just kind of explicitly lay that out there a little bit more. So, like Scott was saying, in, in your family of origin, in our families that we grow up in, love and trust are two of the key dynamics that really are foundational to building a, our type of attachment, our attachment style. And so love, you know, as a kid, when you're, when, like I have a little three-year-old boy, and he's not, he's not asking, you know, dad, do you love me? But, but in a lot of things he's doing, he's looking to see, am I lovable, you know? Am I, am I valuable to you, dad? The way I respond to him, the way I, you know, try to nurture him when he falls down, the way I try to play with him, all these things, he's, you know, he's not asking, am I lovable? But he is asking, you know, inside of himself, am I lovable? Am I valuable? And so the way I respond to him is teaching him uh, this and helping him to believe in his core about who he is. And, and uh, on the other side is he's asking, you know, am I safe? And am I safe is, it speaks to physical safety, but even more so to emotional safety. So as you know, he comes to me or my wife, um, and he's he's uh, he's talking. You know, he loves to talk. He's a real chatter. And, and as 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 I 
you know, let him know it's okay to be him, that I like who he is, that I, that I enjoy his personality, that he can be, be himself with me, you know. As I do that, he starts to realize I'm safe in relationship. I'm safe to be myself. Who I am is lovable, and I can be s secure with relationship. And so that becomes a sort of template uh, if, if you will, that we we all take from our family of origin, or if you grew up with, you know, family members or anybody, wherever you grew up, even your friends, your siblings, they all teach you about love and trust, and your your sense of lovability and your sense of safety. And so, if the answer is, you know, yes, like Scott was saying, then we end up being pretty secure people, as a, for the most part. Now, there's no perfection in this area, so everybody has. You know, even if you have a great family, there's still going to be, you know, you can't be perfect. It's, it's good enough is what, what um, they talk about Mary Ainsworth in that research, the good enough mother. the mother who's mostly available to her kid for the most of the time. You know, there's no perfection. So we're not shooting for that, but, but being as good as you can be. And so for the most part, we can end up being secure if those areas are really well founded. Um, and so one area can be stronger than the other. Some families will have, you know, very loving parents that are, you know, really showing, I love you, you're so great, you know, and, and really feeling lovable. Uh, but on the other, other hand, there may be no safety. Maybe there's addiction in the home, you know. Um, dad comes home one day, he's really uh, happy and fun. The other day, he's drunk, you know, and you don't know how he's going to come angry or, or whether he's going to be the great dad who you love, you know. And so these, this sense of fluctuation and lack of safety is like the kid doesn't know what to, how to predict what's going to happen. So maybe in those moments, he can feel loved but not very safe and vice versa. And so if, if the answer is no to one or both of those areas and in, in a bigger way, we have a lot of pain. There's this, there's this pain about, this insecurity that's painful, it's uncomfortable to us. And so to deal with that pain, we, we have to learn to cope. There's coping styles that we learn to grow up with that really help us to, you know, to deal with this sense of insecurity. And so there's, there's four key coping styles. There's, there's a lot more, but I'm going to boil it down to a few of, a few of them. And so on the, um, on the side of you know, lovable, if, if, if someone does not feel lovable, they don't feel like they're worthy or valuable, there's a tendency of two ways to respond. One is blame and rage. So like Scott was talking about, this anger side comes out. It's your fault that you don't love me. You know, it's, it's everybody else's fault. It's hard to take anything, you know, it's just pushing away. I, either that looks like even road rage, you know, on the road, just angry at the world or angry at those in relationship with us and just in that blame or angry position. And the other side would be, um, would be shame. It would be it's my fault. So anger is it's your fault, it's the world's fault. The shame side is it's my fault. It's because I'm not good enough. It's because I'm a bad person. Because I'm not, there's something wrong with me. And that, that shame can really, uh, you know, keep us internalized. So one's externalizing anger, and the other one is internalizing shame. And, and there's also those of us that tend to be turnstilers. You know, you maybe start in the blame rage side, and then after that go to the shame. Oh, you know, it's, oh, I messed up again. I'm so bad. And then I'll get, you know, it's sort of a, a cycle. But there's one of us that tends to be our primary, our first kind of step, so to speak. And so when someone doesn't feel lovable and valuable, they tend to either go to blame or rage or shame. On the other side is um, safety. Am, am I safe? So if someone doesn't feel safe, there's two ways they tend to try to uh, respond. And this is, a, this is a continuum here. So, you know, the healthy response would be in the middle, able to uh, own your own stuff, you know, but also know when to put some boundaries up and to say, you know, that's not mine, you know. So that would be a healthy, healthy balance to be in the middle. But, um, but the tendency with those that have big wounds is they tend to go extremely one way or the other. Um, so this is also a continuum. So if you don't feel safe, some people tend to try to control. You know, I'm going to make sure everything in my life is as organized and controlled as possible. The people around me, if I can, my children, my environment, my work, control everything. And we know some of these people, and some of us are those people. You know, we just have to manage everything. And so that, that's really t to create some safety, a sense of security, because you don't really feel that safe in the world. Um, and just like Scott was saying, when a child feels secure, interestingly enough, when they have a secure attachment, they're more willing to take risks. They're more willing to uh, uh, advance from the mom and take risks in the world and explore their environment because they have that sense of security. When they're insecure, they either cling on, you know, or they do the other thing Scott was talking about. So one side is to control, is to really just try to manage your environment. 
The other side, which fits into uh, addiction, is chaos. So that's the other extreme of, I'm not going to control everything, I'm just going to check out. I'm going to numb out, I'm going to escape, I'm going to pull away. That may be withdrawing from relationship, that may be going into the addiction, uh, maybe numbing out through TV or you know technology or you know but but that's that's kind of a so one side is to manage and control everything and the other side is to numb out and back away from that because you don't feel safe so those are you know those are the 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 foundations of connection so blame rage shame and control and chaos so and just like Scott was saying you know m many um, the, of uh, sex addicts have these attachment wounds. And Scott didn't mention that statistic, but, but many, um, about 87 or 90 percent, something like that, of sex addicts ha come from addicted, uh, a family member who had an addiction. So, and partners. Uh, partners as well. Partners of sex, sex addicts also have that same statistic. So um, many sex addicts and their partners come from a family of origin with a mom or dad or you know, sibling or somebody very important to them that had an addiction. So that really, like I said, you know, that in unpredictability, that um, disconnection really leads to that sense of insecurity. Uh, also in that same percentage range, I think 87, 90% is um, came, sex addicts came from families with emotional or physical abuse or neglect. So tons of uh, abuse in, in the, the families of sex addicts. And just like Scott was saying, um, rigid and, and or disengaged families. So very little connection and very rigid rules. So you can see how all those really would lead to those big injuries and their sense of lovability and the sense of safety. So, you know, sex addiction is by nature a false attachment. It's an intimacy disorder, but really the addiction, whether it be is, is the uh, computer looking at pornography, whether it be you know with prostitutes, whether it be serial relationships, it's, it's a false attachment. It's attaching to something, but it's not a real connection that's lasting and fulfilling. It's empty. Um, and so, but it's, it's trying to fulfill that void of intimacy and security. So I want to ask you guys a question, and actually you guys, I'm going to give you just a minute, uh, a couple minutes to just talk amongst yourselves and your people around you, and then I'm going to ask you what you, um, what you come back with. So just take like three minutes and answer this question. In your opinion, what is the primary function of the support groups that you guys lead and facilitate? So talk amongst yourself for a minute or two, and then I'll uh, talk to your neighbor, and then um, I'll have you uh, come back and share. George? Fine. Trust and safety. Mm -hmm. The partner down at the end brought up, well, after we've gotten sober and we're doing pretty good, we're really getting into our spiritual life. Mm -hmm. The reasons that got us where we're in. Yeah. So this is where after the shifting gears. Yeah, so to a moving, starting with, or developing that trust and safety and then moving to, and you could even, if you're putting it in these trams, a, a, a secure attachment with God, a spiritual attachment that would become the foundation of your life. So, yeah, good. Well, those are all, you know, there's no wrong answer, obviously, but, you know, for the purpose of this exercise, I wanted you guys to think about that, and, you know, some of the things that you guys mentioned were, yes, accountability is obviously an important part of that, uh, a support group, um, teaching recovery skills, so the educational part of it, you know, what, what are the things you need to learn how to do and do differently and learning, you know, and that's very important, and the other things you guys shared are also very important, and uh, you know, but one one key element that that is from today's talk is that you're helping got when men and women to relearn secure attachment. They didn't get that, you know, in their families growing up. They didn't get that, and so one of the key healing elements is is this relearning a secure attachment, a place to be vulnerable and open with others, and not fear that you're going to get. Uh, maybe if there is a smack, it's a loving smack, and you have relationship to do that out of that the person knows this person cares about me when they're giving me that smack rather than uh, I'm just a bad person shaming, you know? And so, um, so that's one of the major things that I want you guys to think about in your groups is, um, you know, and that, that, that's what you're doing. And so sometimes I hear support group leaders talk about, you know, 
that guy came in there and I called him out and he was, you know, he was just totally lost. And so I just, you know, I just hammered him, you know, and, and sometimes they, we get that sense of power. Like, yeah, I just called that guy out, but the guy never came back again, you know, or he, he wasn't ready for that. And so I'm not saying there's no place for that, but, uh, initially you want people to feel safe and secure. And then that's where the, you know, the interventions can come a bit strong. Just like in therapy, we don't, first session, you don't go in and just lay down the hammer. You build that relationship and that rapport so that you can speak into someone's life. And so, you know, that that's what you guys are doing in, in part in your group. And so, you know, this is some of the, what are the, what are the key facets of uh, the group as a secure base, and what are the, you know, this is a secure attachment, and so some of the some of the key things this is using um, for children, but we'll just apply this to the group member. So one one key um, aspect of the group being a secure place is uh, availability. So. Um, helping the, the group member to trust. So being available in times of need when the, those texts or phone calls come through or, hey man, I'm struggling right now. Hey, can you give me a call? You know, that availability is one of the key elements of developing the group as a secure base. The second one is uh, sensitivity helping the, the group member to manage their feelings and behavior. So that's the responsiveness. It's, you know, part of uh, secure attachment is emotional availability and responsiveness, being responsive to someone's needs when they're in a place of crisis or a place of hurt, when you're responsive to them and hear them and empathize and connect with them and not just kind of nod and, hmm, okay. You know, that really helps the person to feel, manage their own feelings and behaviors because they know that there's a, there's a safe place for them to go. Uh, acceptance as well, building the group member's self-esteem, letting them know that even no matter what they do, even if their behavior is, is wrong, that they are accepted and loved and valued for who they are, even if their behavior, they, because, you know, as we know, it's not an overnight process and some people struggle for years and never gain sobriety. Some of some people jump in and go for it, but those guys that are still, and women that are struggling for a long time, that they're still accepted. They're not shamed for their just struggle with getting sobriety. Uh, cooperation, helping the group member to feel effective and be cooperative. So helping those members in your group to feel like they're giving back, like it's not just receiving, but how can you create a culture of uh, that I'm important to the group, that, uh, that I have a responsibility or I, I'm valued in the group and they need me rather than I'm just kind of a, a I just show up, you know. And the last thing is the, uh, family membership, helping the group member to belong. So belonging, a sense of, uh, yeah, this is my family. This is, my, this is where I can um, be safe. And so those are some of the, the key elements to uh, developing that group as a secure um, attachment base. And so what's the role of the group leader? You know, most of you here are group leaders. So how does this apply to you? Well, one thing that you can do is model authentic attachment. Now, most of you that are leading have had your own or in your own recovery. Um, but, you know, as you guys are at this place in leadership, you're learning about how to uh, attach better and be more vulnerable and, and, and be open. And so, you know, being able to model that to your group members, showing them what it means to be an authentic, uh, relatable person who can connect with them in their struggles and be open. I mean, I, I don't know how exactly you all use your groups in terms of sharing your own stuff, but to, to the right degree, depending on your environment, being able to be vulnerable and be open. Model that vulnerability, because if you show that to your um, group members, they will follow suit, because they see this person's open, this person is vulnerable, that's how you do that. I'm going to do that too. It's a safe place. So that's one of your other key aspects. And then I'm um, really focusing on creating that sense of safety in the group, just really promoting that. So those are, those are some of your key roles. There's obviously the, the accountability part, the organization, the, the leadership, the teaching, all those things. But if you're doing these things well, the, the rest will fall into place because the group will be a place that's vibrant and solid. And so... Uh, like, like kind of like you were talking about is there's there's different orders of change there's I've, if you guys ever heard the terminology first order change and second order change and so first order change is uh, it's the top level of change it's it's the surface change it's stop acting out the behavior stops um, 
and and so there's whether that be through accountability, whether that be through that shame-based system, and, and it's not it's not bad. It's a first order change. But sometimes people will stop acting out and fall back and do it, and they just stop the behavior. But it's not about a paradigm shift. It's not about a a life shift. Second order change is where there's this paradigm shift happening in the, the person in recovery. It's learning to be open with others and developing intimacy, authenticity, and congruency in their life. So congruency means you know, that, you're, that your inside is congruent, is, is with, it's the same as your outside. People know you for you. Obviously, you don't show yourself to everybody all the time, but that you know, there's a sense of internal consistency and external consistency about who you are rather than the lies, the secrets, the hiding. It's my yes is my yes, my no is my no. This is who I am. And so learning to be open and developing intimacy. So if, if you, you know, a lot of sex addicts are isolated. And so as they come out of that isolation and learn intimacy, that's really that second order change. And, and one way to see it too, that we, we talk to Corey, our colleague who couldn't be here today, um, that a lot of times sex addicts, we notice have a lot of road rage for whatever reason. A lot of them are in their cars and tell on how they're getting angry at people around them, yelling at people on the road. And I think that's part of, like I talked about, that blame rage is just blame rage at the world. There's just anger inside. And so, you know, that's the, when the first order change is people maybe start getting some recovery, but the second order change would be, you actually see that, that, that road rage go away, that there's just a, a change in how you're behaving and seeing the world. It's a paradigm shift, not to just not doing things, but learning to operate in a new way. So what's the point of all this? You know, sex addiction is an intimacy disorder. Developing intimacy is the key to recovery. It's really, if, if that's what it is, it's an intimacy disorder and boiled down to its most basic root, um, then developing intimacy is the key to recovery. And vulnerability is the key to intimacy. So vulnerability is what really leads to intimacy. And so how, you know, what does vulnerability mean? We can use that word, we can talk about it, but what, is it, what does it mean? And so there's another way to look at it is that there are, um, secondary emotions and primary emotions. So secondary emotions are, like Scott said, is that, you know, us men, we tend to feel, you know, more quickly is, is anger. That's a pretty common one. I'm angry. Uh, a coldness, rage, defensiveness. It's all these surface level emotions that come out of this angry place. But really there's something deeper going on. But a lot of times um, men and women don't know what's going on below the surface. It's just, I'm angry, I'm pulling away from people, I'm defensive, I'm, but, but what's going on? What's driving that? And so vulnerability is really talking about the primary emotions, what's going on deeper, what's going on below the surface. And a lot of times there's sadness, there's hurt, there's loneliness, there's fear, shame, powerlessness, and hopelessness. So there's these deeper things going on that are below the surface that we don't pay attention to. And, and if you're not in touch with these things, they'll find their way out one way or the other, whether that be through you sharing that in a healthy context where people are connecting with you or through coming out through an addiction because you're, I, I feel like you're, God wired us to be in connection. He, wi he wired us to share with people and to be in tune with ourselves. And when we're not in tune, the engine starts to misfire. We start to go out of whack. And so we start acting out in different ways, anger, rage, sexual addiction, other things. You know, it, we cannot uh, function without being able to, to deal with all these, these hurts and, and sad, sadness and shame that we have inside of us. And we all have this. It's, all, it's, human, it's, it's human to have these feelings. And so part of, part of um, getting vulnerable is to understand for yourself what's going on below the surface for me. Why am I so mad all the time? You know, why am I pulling away all the time? What is going on inside of me? And some of us are not in tune with that. We don't take any time to reflect or have maybe, maybe therapy, maybe a good friend. You know, different things like that can help you to understand what is going on inside of me. So what are some of the practical steps to vulnerability? You know, one just simple is journaling. You know, writing your thoughts and feelings down on paper, and it may seem cheesy to some of us, but it's a really good place to, to, to have a safe place to write out your thoughts and feelings and what's going on and what am I feeling right now? And because some of us don't know how to connect with our, with our primary emotions. We don't know how to get down deep without just in our heads. It gets lost. And so journaling is a nice way to do that. 
Another way is, you know, finding safe people to talk to. So whether that be a therapist, whether that be a good friend, whether that be an accountability partner, um, just learning to, to open up and starting to share beyond just the surface level stuff, going deeper about what's really happening inside. Um, prayer, that vulnerability with God, that there's that place of where, where a secure attachment can definitely come and does come from, from the Lord. I think we need other people too. We can't just say God does everything for us because we, we are humans. We we're made to connect with human beings and we can't isolate in just a spiritual bubble. But now, not that, nonetheless, God is huge in that. And so if we can pray to him and not just pray for different stuff, but cast our cares upon him, you know, really open our hearts to him so that he can minister to our hearts. Then we can start learning, man, I'm really feeling alone right now. I'm really feeling afraid. I'm really feeling ashamed, you know, and uh, so learning those types of things. So, um, you know, and I want to, I'm going to have you guys go into a, a group interaction now talking about, um, the question is, what were some of the love and trust wounds you experienced in your family of origin and how do you tend to cope? So, you know, that's really, this is a, an exercise in vulnerability with each other, starting to share a little bit about some of the wounds that we had. And I'll, I'll, I'll start off, you know, in, in that same note is, you know, I grew up in, in a, and I'll even, this so you guys can see, um, you know, I grew up in a, in a I, fortunately, I grew up in a really healthy family with, with um, my dad was a pastor, which doesn't mean anything about a healthy family, but my dad was pretty healthy, my mom, and, uh, and so we did, I did have a pretty good sense of security in that, but I did, I have an older sister, and she, she was, she's two years older than me, and she just, I don't know why, but she was always very, uh, just mean to me and controlling and, and I, uh, she would tell me to get out of her airspace and she just was really, if I'd play with her and I'd always get in trouble, I'd always be doing something wrong and she was more dominant. I was a little bit more just kind of, I, I didn't want to get in fights and she was a bit more get out there and just fight and not worry about it as much and for me I was more sensitive to that stuff and so I learned growing up pretty quickly that even though I felt pretty safe with my parents I didn't feel safe with her I felt like whatever I was going to do I was going to mess up I was going to be in trouble and and so I just learned to go with the flow you know I didn't I didn't go into controlling per se I kind of went into just kind of back away you know to, to the chaos I not addiction or anything but just kind of withdrawing from from uh, feeling like I could just be myself I could just open up and share. I could just play on a, on a I became self-conscious because I was always worried about what are people going to think of me? Am I going to do something wrong? And and so that, that left, I had to work through that, you know, into my adult life is, you know, just not feeling very secure. And I remember my, we'd come home from a trip and my sister would fall asleep in the car or whatever on the way home and we'd wake up in the garage and my parents would be like, you stay in the car, Andrew, and we'll send your sister up to the bathroom. Because if I was in the same bathroom with her, when she woke up, she would just tear my head off. So I was always kind of learning that I need to just get out of the way. And my parents should have probably sent me up there first and made her stay in the car. But I learned I need to just kind of just get out of the way and let, let, if she's angry, I just need to back off, you know. And, and so that was kind of one way that I would felt like I, I didn't, in some ways I'm wounded in my sense of feeling safe with people. And in another way is, you know, my dad was great overall, but he, he was very, he was a pastor, he was a musician, he was very on stage with people, and, and um, but he was very in his own, he was kind of preoccupied, he was busy, he was thinking about music, he's a musician, and, and so I remember we'd drive to the beach to go surfing, he and I'd surf together, and, and I was young still, and, and we'd be driving in the car, and he'd just be, he wouldn't talk to me, he'd just be in his own world thinking about music, or listening to music, and I remember sitting there just wondering, Dad, are you going to, like, ask me how I'm doing, you know, are you going to just pursue me a little bit, and show me that I'm lovable, that I'm valuable? and and he I don't think he didn't he didn't mean to but he was just he just kind of um, just preoccupied and so I remember I had to ask him like hey dad how's it going you know and I'm like I'm like 12 years old and I'm asking my dad how he's doing he should be doing that for me you know and and so that left me with a sense of well what, what's is there something wrong with me you know like why doesn't my dad want to pay attention to me in that way and and so you know that caused me some wounds and and that saw some on the shame side of things was just to to feel like I wasn't that worthy what where do I stand with my dad why is he not pursuing me more and and so th those are some of the the wounds that I had growing up and so you know in that in that same model of vulnerability if you know I know you guys don't all know each other that well but to whatever degree you feel comfortable maybe answer that question with each other is how what were some of the ways that your family affected you and how you relate and whether that played into your addiction or just your life now and and what are some of the ways that you've learned to cope with that so um, feel free to share and then we got about 15 minutes or so and then uh, we'll go from there okay
Trina is going to come forward and share about, is it called Connection is the Protection? Yeah. The Correction is Connection. The Correction is Connection. So building on that same theme, how Connection is, is the Correction um, to our woundedness. So my colleague Trina, come on up. While you guys stretch, let me just say that my talk is going to be explaining a take-home tool we want to send with you guys in case you want to have a handout for your group members, your wives, your addicts, your husbands. Um, I have an attachment tool handout. So did everybody get this one already? I'm Trina. I work with um, everybody, Andrew and Corey and Scott and... Denise and Aaron, and I'm part of the sexual addiction team. I run a couple groups for wives um, of sex addicts, and then I have run a love addicts, love and sex addicts group for women in the past also. Would love to start another one. Um, well, in our various offices. <laughs> I don't have one. Yeah, at, at RCA Counseling. So if you have women that you think could use a therapy group beyond the ministry, you know, the church group, then... I'd love a collection and get going with them, too. Okay, so what I want to do in my talk is go through this handout and explain it so that you get it, so that it's useful to you, and you can make copies and tell the people in your group when you think it'll be helpful. All right, so this is the connection handout. Let me s experiment with how I make this go to the next thing. Nope. Ah! Well, we'll just spacebar. Space bar. Thank you. All right. So, connection is the correction for um, these marriages that get busted apart. As a husband and wife, you know, as it comes out, what's been going on behind the scenes, and it's also the correction for just the addiction itself. It's learning attachment as you leave addiction behind, and it's also the correction for the the spouse's heart. Um, they don't realize it, but there's been such a lack of connection in their marriage. And a lot of times, um, wives and husbands thought things were okay, or they knew they didn't have a perfect marriage, and they, they were working on it as hard as they could, but they really didn't have the full picture of the depth of um, the gap between them. So, so we're going to, even the wives and husbands of addicts need to learn to have true attachment with their spouse and recognize when it's not present. And that's a safety feature. You know, a big part of being a partner is needing to know this relationship is as safe as it appears. And how do I know that? So, um, here we go. Space bar. <laughs> okay, so if you look at your handout, on the top there is a small little two-sided chart that we're going to go through. So the first part, uh, the first chart talks about connection, and then it says, underneath it says, um, secure, well-being, joy, and deepening. And as uh, the overhead says, so with connection, when we're in a safe, connected, genuine relationship, we feel so secure. Just like Scott and Andrew were building the case for, you know, and there's just such a sense of security, and that makes uh, us have a sense of well-being. We just have a sense of well-being, and so there's joy there. There's not anxiety or irritation. It's, it's just a joyful relationship. And with that, there's the safety and the desire to deepen it and to step further into it and grow that relationship more, which again leads to more security, more well-being and joy, more deepening. And then it, we keep going. And so it's this wonderful spiral into a deeper and deeper relationship, more and more secure attachment. And that's why marriages that are growing and healthy, you know, when you first get married, there's the high, but then you get real, and there's a crash. And then, um, the, if we make it, there's just wonderful, and those golden years can be really special. Couples so knit together with all that vulnerability and authentic authenticity and the love that's been fostered over the years. And that's, of course, all of our heart's desire is to make relationships work. So it's a deepening circle. So even though it's just a little box on your page and I don't have the cycle thing, it's another cycle up there. So as you explain, explain, you know, that all this um, security leads to a desire to deepen the relationship and go deeper into it. But if you aren't connected, there's disconnection and that's on the other side of that graph 
when we go along and we think we're connected with people, we think we're connected with God, we think we're connect, you know, we're feeling connected, we're feeling kind of secure. Well, what if it's been a false place and suddenly we realize it? Or what if it's been real, but suddenly it gets disconnected? Like, say you're having a great weekend with your spouse, but then suddenly you guys stumble into this argument and it's just nasty and you're, all of a sudden there's disconnection. Or you're going along with your walk with God and suddenly something bad happens in your life. Your child, uh, you know, has cancer. Something big. Or your husband or wife has been cheating on you. Something big. Suddenly there's disconnect with you and God. You think, what? I thought we were, I thought he loved me. I thought he protected me. I thought we were connected. But suddenly I don't trust him. I feel like he's far away from me. Or I feel like I'm angry at him. And so bam, there's disconnection. So we can have disconnection in any relationship. Um, even with our kids, our siblings. And when it happens, it's a shock to the system. And the deeper the disconnect, the harsher the shock. And, and it's painful. And so... First, like the first feelings of that pain are shame and anger. And so when you experience disconnect in an intimate, attached relationship or one you expect to be a safe attachment, first there's a little flash. Some people bigger, some people smaller time frame. But what did I do? Why, don't, why aren't they being nice to me? What's, what's wrong with me that they aren't being loving and good to me? That's the shame. And then it's coupled and maybe one takes dominance in somebody's heart versus the other. Um, how dare they do this to me? Um, they're so bad and I, I don't deserve any of this. So that's the shame and anger that zoom in with disconnection. Our response to this person now becomes distorted. We're no longer a safe person for them either. We're angry. We're hiding in shame. We're attacking in anger. Uh, we're walking on eggshells. So we are responding in a distorted way, which furthers the disconnect because we're no longer available for safe connection. So the disconnect is further furthered, and they might respond in shock um, or just the shock continues, and there's the anger and shame grow. We continue the distorted Response. So what happens when sexual addiction is discovered in a relationship like between kids and parents or between husbands and wives? Sexual addiction is discovered. There's such a sense of shock. Um, there's so much shame and anger. And the anger can go both ways. Addict to spouse, spouse to addict. Um, and and it, we realize, actually what I wanted to be saying is that we've been living in this place for a long time without realizing it often. I'm sorry. Um, and there's been a lot of shame and anger in the relationship, and we haven't quite known where it stemmed from. Um, and there's been a lot of distortion of deception, of eggshells, of irritability. And so knowing about attachment theory that we're talking about today helps explain where all that came from. We didn't know. It's because of the disconnect that the addiction was causing, that secret life means we weren't truly connected. It wasn't a safe attachment relationship with all the security. No wonder there was so much shame and anger and distortion in that relationship. And we got stuck in that place. So um, now we're going to look at the cycles a little more closely. So the next diagram on your handout shows the cycle aspect of it with the arrows. Oh, but before we go to that, I do want to highlight again um, I stole, I steal a lot from 12-step recovery groups, and they talk about sanity, or I say right relationship, um, and healthy living is right relationship between me and God, me and other people, that'd be my spouse and um, or kids, whoever the sexual addiction is impacting, um, even the people we act out with, and me and myself right relationship there. So I can be connected or disconnected from God and experience either all the well-being we talked about or all the anger and shame and doubt we talked about. I can be connected or disconnected from the significant others in my life. That one's kind of obvious. We've been talking about that. And I can be connected or disconnected from myself. And I think addiction and even co-addiction, that's a huge factor of our healing and recovery is to start 
learning what's really going on beneath the surface of me, those secondary emotions. Oh, I have sadness. I have so much loneliness. I'm so hurt here. That's getting connected with yourself is getting connected with your primary emotions. And something that didn't get um, brought out yet is that under those primary emotions, those are important to know because under those are needs. We, if we're lonely, we need love. If we're sad, we need comfort. If we're anxious or scared, we need safety or reassurance. So that's why we got to touch with those um, secondary emotions is so that we can figure out the need and go get it met. And we can get our needs met with God. We can meet our own needs. We can get our needs met with a friend, with a safe other, a mentor, a prayer partner. So really... We look at attachment with God, with myself, with other people. We can be connected or disconnected in any arena because of our uh, leading to needs, which can, we go get attached and connected. Our needs start getting met in any of these arenas. And if we're living in disconnection in any one of these arenas, we're actually living in disconnection in pretty much all of them. It's kind of all or nothing. I picture three, um, you know, I don't know why I picture this, but in a sound, the sound control of a church, what's that called, the soundboard? The mixer. You know, they have all these little uh, slides. So I picture these as three slides, but they're kind of loosely connected. So if one's really high and, you know, I'm really connected with God, then they're all kind of really high. Or if, if one's really low, like I'm hiding and lying to my spouse, then that one's really low. Well, hello, they're all really low. So, so I can't be having a sexual addiction and be connected with God, and I can't be connected with my significant others because I have a secret life, and I can't, I'm not connected with myself because I'm not getting my true needs met. I don't even know my true feelings. Um, I'm just so not aware. And so disconnect everywhere. Um, and for a spouse, on the spouse's side, you know, f- thinking I'm connected with people, but generally there's so much pain in the marriage even before you discover what's going on, generally speaking, but a lot of times we put on a happy face or we manage it in certain ways and we don't let ourselves really feel the depth. There's a certain amount of disconnect we're living with ourselves and that allows us to go with the flow in this painful circumstance of distortion and um, and we pursue God and we th- and we believe and there is a sense of connection there but the connection deepens so much in recovery we realize we weren't as far as we thought and the trust we invest in him and the love we receive from him grows so much in recovery for both parties that we realize I wasn't as connected as I thought so if if we know that these little mixer lovers are all connected, the good news is I can work on my availability for connection and attachment. Healing, that's a healing thing for me, and it's a blessing for the people in my life through any of these avenues. So my spouse, my, my husband, my wife doesn't have to be ready to attach and connect with me for me to be okay. I can connect and attach with myself. I can connect and attach with God. And I can attach and connect with other people in my group um, who get it and who are safe. And and I'm going to become healthy even if my spouse isn't on board. So, So knowing all this and the attachment theory helps take the pressure off my spouse, whether it's the addict or the co addict, for things to be okay. Even in the marriage, I can... I can tolerate a waiting period to see are we going to work out or not instead of, you know, making that hasty decision we we want to protect ourselves. So um, now we're going to go to the cycles on your page. So any given point in time, we're kind of on one of these circles or the other. And sometimes they switch quickly and sometimes you're able to stay in one longer. So we're going to look at first connection. So this circle says when you're cycling in connection, safe relationship is happening and love deepens in a safe relationship. That's what we said on the first little chart up there. Love is deepening. But love 
like Scott said, is knowing and being known. And so with a deepening relationship, there's the pressure to expose more of yourself. They're going to see more of my inadequacies, more of my weaknesses. If I choose to move forward in this relationship, they're going to know my sins. They're going to know um, my, you know, my imperfections. And so there's this tension in a healthy, growing relationship, there's a tension. And it starts building, building the tension to, to expose more of myself, to risk more. And so on your chart, you see how the two circles are connected? So you get a choice. There's this choice point right there. After tension builds, which circle will I zoom along? Am I going to go to the right or to the left? I could choose to stay in connection, risk a little more vulnerability by stepping further into the relationship, letting them know something more about me, letting them becoming more needy, aware of my needs and sharing with my partner and hoping they meet me there. And then, oh, they did. Oh, I love them so much. This is so awesome. And then, you know, it goes around and around in a deepening, growing relationship. Or we think, I can't tell them. How, you know, how mad I am at them because they won't be able to take it, we think. Or I can't tell them what I was doing last night because they'll divorce me in two seconds. And so, ooh, we swing over into disconnection. We go away from that authentic deepening of relationship and we get disconnected. Um, so in the safe relationship, as the love deepens, love forces us to become vulnerable if we stay in it. So that vulnerability is a tense place. And we might zoom over to the disconnected circle. This is where if I'm not connected with, with you, I'm in my own head. And, and I'm not just connected with myself. You can't only have one or the other. So I'm kind of in my head. In, a lot of intellectuals live in their head. They're not really connected with their heart. And it's hard to really have a deep relationship with someone like that um, the person in their head. We go to our heads. So, you know, addicts are going to start in the addiction. They're going to go to their head and start thinking about their fantasy life. I can't wait to get back to the strip club. Um, However, whatever they're thinking, the, the, the preoccupation part of an addiction is thinking about it, thinking about your addiction. The preoccupation of the co-addiction part is thinking about your spouse. Is he acting out? Is he going to be mad? Is she acting out? Um, what are they thinking now? Are they really working a good recovery program? All this in my head going on. There's not a connection with God. I'm not putting it in God's hands or exposing myself to God. There's not a connection with my true gut needs. And, and there's not a connection with other people because I'm all up in my head. And so um, it allows us to avoid the relationship and being vulnerable when we go in our own heads. It's a safe, quick fix. But that's a painful place. We're disconnected. We're out of it. We're in insecure attachment now. And there's a pain there. And so to manage the pain, we can act out. We can go. Um, and plus the preoccupation, you know, makes us think about acting out. So if you're preoccupied with your recovering addict spouse, the acting out might be yelling and shaming. You know, you're such a pervert. I can't believe you did these things. You, the women who break things in the house, the husbands who, you know, not break things in the house. <laughs> this is, there's an acting out on both sides. I'm really trying to paint the picture that this is a truth and a good tool for both sides of the equation. And that acting out, there's an acting in, you know, we could just stuff it and eat or, um, I'm going to call eating acting out too, but anything we do to cope that's not healthy. And so then we feel bad. You know, I did it again. I can't let them know. I can't tell my friends. Um, and the shame of how we are experiencing ourselves and what we're doing leads us back to that choice point. Again, do I just escape back into my head? Um, because I don't want anyone to really know what, what just happened here. I feel really bad about it. Or do we make the choice to go back into relationship? Get real somewhere connect with God, self, or others in a real way, which means with, with all three, and go back in there, get risk sharing what really just happened, and start living there again. Sometimes, you know, there's this circle eight pattern that's really painful in marriage too. If somebody does this, they're in relationship for a while, and then they go back 
out and disconnect, um, whether they're acting out or just getting the, the attitude that co-addicts can get very self-righteous and very um, annoyed with their mate easily. And so that would be the coldness and the uh, critical thinking would be the disconnect. And so we might cycle. That's hard. That's not, that's not a good, that's not a place to say, oh, we've made it. You don't want to rest there. You want to you start living on that connection circle. All right. So the last part, stinking thinking versus the recovery mindset. This last part it refers to that chart at the bottom of your page. It reflects, the left side reflects the stinking thinking, right? The pride, the arrogance, secretiveness, maverick behavior means just going off and doing what you want. Screw everybody else. Um, and then the other side is a recovery mindset. And it's so what God calls us to in the Bible, you know, be humble, be a service to others, be genuine and authentic and vulnerable. It's so awesome to see how God's truth just fits with um it's with psychology, recovery, I don't know what you want to call it, with human relationships. He knows. He knows. So um, addicts can, what, so what I do with my partners, because I work with a lot of partners, is I say, you know what? This is a great tool for you because we all know, well, we're all learning not to trust words, but to trust actions, right? Like if he says, I'm sorry, I swear, nothing's happening, don't trust that. Trust the actions. See, wh what is he doing? Because the, they might make promises and break them or whatnot. But we look at actions, not words. But then they say to me, yeah, but Trina, <laughs> I don't always see everything he's doing. Everything was done in secret and I didn't even know. So I can't see all his actions. How do I know what he's doing? So what I say is, well, you can see attitude. And th this list is all about heart attitude. You can see true connection, availability for connection versus uh, disconnection, where they're just not available for connection and contact. So we use this tool to start feeling more safe in the relationship. You can look at your addict spouse and kind of see which attitude are they displaying. Are they working more in the recovery side? Um, with flashes, of course, on the other side as, as we learn and grow? Or are they living more on the stinking thinking side and they're, you know, they're only faking it for a few flashes of a second? You cannot fake the recovery mindset long term. You can't. It's a, it's a heart change. And then it makes me think of the Lord again. He gives us a new heart. And he writes his law upon our hearts so that we love it and we want it. So, so we're looking at second order change. I think Andrew talked about first order change, which is just stopping the behavior. And second order change, which is this heart change. So you don't even like that. You don't even want that behavior when you're living here. And we can see this um, in our partners. So it's really handy for spouses to, to have a sense of where the relationship is so they can gauge how much trust and vulnerability to risk um, or how wise it is to hold back. And it's also good because sp uh, spouses and partners lose track of their own availability and safety for connection. We think we're like the perfect spouse and if our partner would just get their act together, it would all be better. And so it's really cool to look at this list for me. Am I having this cold, hard attitude? Am I critical? Am I being demanding? Those are all on the stinking thinking list. And oh my gosh, I'm not even an addict. And I'm, and look, and I'm right here with him. So it's so good to go, oh, I need to get a grip on myself. Quit thinking about what they're doing over there. Focus here where I have some power and ability to grow. And, you know, get on my knees. Get in the word. Call a friend from my support group. Um, just journal, Con you know, all these tools to get connected with self, God, or others so that I'm ready. I'm available for connection when my partner is. We got to live in that vulnerable place, ready to risk in a relationship. We're not sure how it will turn out. And so this is a really good tool. And then it's a good tool for addicts too, because they can gauge, where am I today? It could be a daily check-in tool, really. Where's my heart today? What do I need to do to get in connection? Because connection is my 
my freedom. That is my ticket out of this thing is to remain in connection with myself, with God and with other people. And so look at my heart because our heart, you know, we can be deceived and think we're doing pretty well. But if you look at this list, you can see, oh, wow, I am kind of feeling critical of my spouse and I'm um, kind of feeling this urge to do things my way and, and not the way the group needs. And so you can go, ooh, I need to get in connection before I swing too far toward the acting out stuff that I'm leaving. And um, and then it's just a reminder for them that this this is so important. This is the ticket out. So I love this tool. I give this to almost every uh, person struggling with sex addiction, whether it's on one side of the coin or the other in terms of relationship, and go over it with them. And, and, um, and they all refer to it again because it's really useful. So I hope you guys are able to use this too. So depressed might have to do with serotonin levels. And so um, it's kind of you want to look at the big picture instead of, oh, they have one danger zone. It's, it's more the whole picture. And also, if someone is struggling with depression, you want to encourage them to not live there. That's not what God has for us. You know, if, if, if healthier lifestyle doesn't work for you, um, go get medication, you know, because it's a serotonin level thing. And, um, and depression does take us out of relationship. It might not mean we have secret life or bad character or poor attachment skills, but it does mean that we are not available for a whole joyous relationship. Um, can you see that or should I explain that further? It's very hard on relationships. Yeah, so it's, it's almost our um, duty to the lo our loved ones to fight our depression um, with all the tools we have. The first thing you do is you get a grip on your behavior, right? So if we're talking about spouses, co-addicts, they get a grip on the acting out in their anger and they, they start reigning in their raging. Um, they start reigning in their tense tendency to isolate. They reign in their critical thinking. Oh my goodness, there's so many critical angry thoughts going on in their head that just aren't hurting anybody else because nobody's hearing them, but they are just eating you up from the inside and ruining you for relationship. So, so the spouses have a lot of behaviors to stop. That's the first order of change that needs to happen. But if their heart is still bitter, their heart is still smug and self-righteous, their heart is still, I didn't deserve any of this, you jerk. You know, I'm the good one. I hear it's, it's a painful play. It's a beautiful, it's a spiritual awakening, just like Brene Brown said. It looks like a breakdown of the marriage, but it's a spiritual awakening call for both partners. And so to become humbled and, um, you know, a lot of times spouses come in and say, I did it all by the rules. I was a virgin until we got married. I met him in the church. I followed God all my life. I was a good wife, a good mother. You know, why did this happen to me? There's such a change to realize um, how broken I was too and how how much I need a savior, how much I need grace from my partner um, and to just, just be humbled, just be humbled, just like every single, just to join, join the human race in the muck instead of thinking, I was so clean. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I think there's a transitional season for sure. Yeah, and it might include sexual relapse or not uh, in terms of acting out, but but acting out could just be you know the the um, the angry exchanges between spouses or the cold season, the cold war that could happen. Um, those just anything hurtful that ends up happening when you're in disconnect. So that's when you up your connection to self, God, and others to meet a lot of those needs that aren't getting met with spouse, but there are lots of others in the world. So you find a couple key people that can love you, help you, you know, they can be there for you in a way your spouse isn't, and just prayer, ask God, I mean, spiritual warfare prayers for change of heart. God's the one who changes hearts. And... Um, but I'm wrapping up. This is great to share. A couple to know together 
can say, they have language now, common language. Hey, I feel like we're disconnected. I really want to reconnect with you. And then they know they get to do what it takes to connect with God's self or others, swing back around to that other circle. I've seen couples be able to talk like that and meet each other there, and it's really cool. Okay, this question says, please speak to where and when it's appropriate to be vulnerable, authentic, and transparent. For example, is it appropriate to share with a church group not associated with recovery? So, um, there definitely are places to be, to be able to share safely and places that aren't. So, two considerations would be... Um, does this benefit them or not? Is it going to harm them? Or is it going to help them or be neutral? And what's my motivation? Do I need to share this now? Is this an important thing to share? Um, this is a healthy, wise motivation. So you just kind of, this is such a delicate topic. And so many people are caught off guard by it who aren't aware or haven't walked in it. So on one hand, it's, Important to, not important, but building awareness out there through our honesty is a good thing, but um, bringing it up in a place that might get, you know, off topic or be distracting or become all about you wouldn't be a good thing. So there's just a lot of wisdom in terms of who to share with, who not. Also, the safety of these people. Are they safe people who are going to keep it private, what you shared in that situation? Um who are going to respond to you with compassion versus judgment. So it's a good question. I don't know that there are hard and fast rules except just to go gently. Um, and then even our intimates, like this question, the example is people I don't, in a church group, which is one level of intimacy, but then there are you know family members like children and spouses and then neighbors. So they're all levels of intimacy. And if you're sharing in a church group, this is tricky because will it get back to your children who you haven't told? So it's just something to be very careful that I think sharing too, I think erring on the side of caution is actually better than just sharing your story wherever you go. Um, that's a hard thing. I know a case where Someone was pretty discreet with who they shared with, but none of us are perfect. And then a number of years later, someone who'd heard um, shared with their parents, their older parents who have, you know, and they're like in their midlife and the parents are older and the, that there'd been unfaithfulness. Now the parents who they'd never told their parents came and asked questions and it got real awkward and, and hurtful. So, you know, and, and so it's good also to be prepared if people ask. Now do you share with them if they ask? It's nice to have um, pre-prepared answers so that you only share how much is appropriate with these different intimacy levels. The, the other question, and wow, this, this can be tricky. When, when do and how do I share with my adult children my past, family of origin, and then... When do I share with them th that I married a sex addict? Pardon me, I don't have my reading glasses on. It's getting to be that time of life. Um, wow. Okay. So, so this is this is tricky. It's not it's not really a simple thing, and there are a lot of layers to this. And early on in recovery, usually I'm working with the guys, so I'll talk about guys when I talk about the sex addicts because it's usually the guys I'm working with. Um, Early on in recovery, I can tell them that that this may become part of your testimony or it might not. You may be called to share this with a lot of people or you might not. You do need some people that are in your life that know the whole story that you can be real with. With your as we work with as we work with sex addicts and partners, Often there's things that haven't been disclosed and we go through a disclosure process because we want to be able to get all the secrets out there. It doesn't mean you need to know every detail about 
every sex position or you know the, the gory details that are going to re-traumatize you but 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 you need to know that story so when so let's let's say we're talking about family of origin partly it depends how safe are those people going to be for you is that going to be a safe place for you for you to share it then another consideration is where are you at with your partner on this is it going to re-traumatize your partner to have this out before he or she is far enough into their own recovery to that that they're ready to have it shared so i think it so i think it also has to be something of a joint decision of how, of how you share that um then with the adult children it it takes a lot of discernment of how much of the how what level of detail do you want them to know about about this it can and what is your motivation for doing it is it intimacy is it authenticity is it letting them know what's in the family that they might want to know about what what's what's motivating it so I, I think it's a very complex and individual answer to when and how much that gets shared part of this is I want them to. Uh, I want them to have a real view to what has ha what has happened in my life. I want to be authentic with them. I, I want to really let them into who I am, some of the traumas I've dealt with, it, both from a standpoint of having greater intimacy with them, and also from and also from a standpoint of hoping that that will keep this from being a generational pattern that repeats itself okay. so that so that if you can see if you can see how this has come through the generations and i really want it to stop i really want it to stop with me and for you not to experience the trauma and heartache that i've experienced okay yeah so so make it so part of your testimony as well so I want this to be part of my testimony of what God has done in my life and how far I've been able to come as a result of that. Uh, as a result of that, and I would look at those and go, "That those are, th those are all, th those all sound like healthy motivations to me to do that." So then, so then with your partner, it's talking, it's kind of talking about, well, what do we share and and what and what's the what are the implications here? Would be my thought. Okay. Um, and the last question is, are all people that have affairs sex or love addicts? And the answer is no. You know, not some people just fall into affairs for uh, a variety of reasons. You know, maybe they just had poor boundaries. Maybe they were, um, you know, just not. A lot of times, it's poor boundaries or disconnection in their marriage. But an addiction is a different level. An addiction is it becomes compulsive. The person wants to stop and can't stop. It becomes there's usually an escalation involved over time. Whether it started maybe with pornography or strip clubs, then it worked its way up to affairs. Um, and so, you know, as, uh, there's there's severe consequences because of their behavior. Um, so there's a lot of more a lot more in there than just saying anybody who has an affair would be a sex addict. No, that's that's definitely not the case. Um, they have to be assessed whether that's compulsive or whether it's just they didn't care. They had a they had a cold heart or you know they they were had bad boundaries. Um, so there's a lot of different reasons for affairs. So we don't want to lump everybody into a sex addict category because not everybody's an addict. Um, uh, the second part is, uh, how do you determine when a sex addict who's unmarried is healthy enough to begin dating or get married? That's a good question. You know, I think um, one of the key elements you want to have is sobriety, that there's been an extended period of sobriety where the person is, um, you know, able to not keep falling back into those behaviors. I think that's really important. I think that, well, like what we're talking about, they're able to be more vulnerable. They've got a healthy, you, you if it's you you're asking about or others, there's a healthy support system in place, God, self, others, you know, that there's that secure connection going on. Um, I think you also want to see that, um, sometimes depending on the addiction that that relationship that you're getting into that the person depending like, like Scott was saying whether they need to know this or not but it's often helpful to to inform the person you want to date it kind of a little bit about your history so they know that there's uh, what they're getting into um, you have to play that out with wisdom but it's often you know helpful to have people know about your context um, 
and so I think those are the key things. You know that there's that second order change, and it's it's a process of time. But I think if you're still really struggling in your addiction and you're still really not um, at a place of sobriety and still isolated, it's not a good time to start dating. Go a little longer down the road till you have some deeper, stronger sobriety and in that deeper second order sense.